tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We hit turbulence and we all hit the roof and everything fell down. Panic over the Pacific. Passengers seriously injured when an Air Canada flight from Vancouver hit severe turbulence also. Oh, I just spent $100 to fill up my little car, so <laughs> it still hurts. Land costs and credit cards, what's now being blamed for soaring gas prices and... We don't plan to change uh, what we're doing. The curation of our uh, BC local wines is going to stay the same. Why you won't find imported wines for sale at some BC grocery stores. This is CBC Vancouver News. The plane just sank and then flew up. The lady in front of us, I don't think she had her seatbelt on. She hit the ceiling. Nine people are seriously hurt tonight after severe turbulence sent passengers out of their seats on an Air Canada flight from Vancouver. Good evening. That plane was en route to Sydney, Australia and had to be diverted to Honolulu. Our Tina Lovegreen joins us now live with more. So Tina, take us through what happened there. Well, Mike and Anita, the 37 people who were injured ranged from children to the elderly. 30 of the passengers were taken to hospital upon landing in Honolulu. And we've been told nine of them are suffering from serious injuries, from concussions to cuts to the head and neck pain. And now we do have some video to show you from the moment inside the plane. It shows the severe turbulence that caused the Boeing aircraft to plunge steeply. The seatbelt sign was off at the time and the sudden drop caused some passengers to fly from their seats, hitting the roof or the overhead compartments. And you could see that some oxygen masks actually came down and people were just scrambling, trying to figure out what happened. Have a listen to passengers describe the terrifying ordeal. Just woke up to some turbulence and then the next second the whole plane dropped and people hit the ceiling and a whole bunch of people were injured. A lot of screaming. Uh, see in front of me, the girl hit the, hit the plastic overhead and actually snapped and broke it. And the oxygen masses came down and uh, you had a lot of panic. Now, we do have a map showing the route of the flight. The plane carrying 269 passengers and 15 crew members was heading to Sydney, Australia from Vancouver. It was two hours past Hawaii when suddenly it hit that unexpected turbulence. That's when the pilots decided to turn the plane around and head to Honolulu so the passengers could get the medical attention they needed. And officials there really applauding themselves tonight for how they responded to this emergency. Have a listen. One of the things that Hawaii is known for is our aloha spirit. And part of that is when we all come together to assist each other. We had federal, state, city, and private entities come together to ensure the safety of everyone that was on this affected flight. And I want to say to everybody involved, including the pilots and the staff on the plane, congratulations on a job well done, no lives lost, and we're very, very pleased with the outcome. So again, 37 passengers were injured, nine suffering serious injuries after the aircraft hit unexpected turbulence. Terrifying moments, Tina. What are we hearing from Air Canada tonight? Well, Air Canada is also saying that they're pleased with how things went. They issued this statement. It reads in part, our first priority is always the safety of our flights, passengers and crew. We're currently making arrangements for the passengers, including hotel accommodations and meals in Honolulu, as well as options for resumption of the flight. And for those who are concerned about their loved ones, they're being asked to contact Air Canada directly for more information. Our Tina Lovegreen live tonight. Thanks, Tina. You're welcome. Well, some answers tonight on why gas prices are sky high here compared to the rest of Western Canada. The BC Utilities Commission is looking into the discrepancy at the pump. Henry Ross now on some of the reasons we pay more. Gas prices aren't as high in Vancouver today as they were in the spring when they hit $1.70 per litre. But BC drivers are still wondering why they're paying more at the pumps than the rest of Western Canada. Oh, I just spent $100 to fill up my little car, so <laughs> it still hurts. <laughs> this new report from the BC Utilities Commission explains why, sort of. It shows that gas prices have risen in line with land prices and credit card processing fees. But what does this have to do with gas? Well, the report says it has to do with Vancouver gas retail margins. That's the difference between wholesale and retail fuel prices and how it correlates with land values. On top of that, credit card fees are applied as part of a transaction. 
those fees are higher in places where prices are already high at the pump, like Vancouver. Most credit card fees uh, are anywhere from represent one and a half to three cents on a litre of gasoline. Now that data is about eight years of age, but there was a big issue in uh, Ottawa on this a few years ago. So for gas stations, they have to pass those uh, costs on in the form of a retail margin. And it tends to be very high in a market like Vancouver, where, as we only too well know, the real estate costs are extremely high as well, commercial and residential. But that doesn't completely explain the difference. Even after comparing wholesale gas prices with Vancouver and Kamloops and Edmonton and Seattle, the report still can't explain why wholesale gas prices are so much higher in BC cities. So what comes next? Well, the next phase of the report will keep digging, looking at how factors like competition and transport costs impact the price of gas, perhaps offering some answers to BC drivers who have been asking questions for months now. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. The local grocery stores can now put imported wine on their shelves, right next to the BC products they already sell. But as Mickey Cowan reports tonight, even though they can now offer customers more choices, some stores have decided not to. Flowers are a very delicate time because if you get a lot of rain, it knocks the flowers off. It was intended to give local wineries and cideries a leg up, but the policy that restricted grocery store sales to BC-only beverage makers wasn't to last. Overall, I think it's been great exposure, but the party had to come to an end sometime. So. The government's new policy is now in effect, allowing grocers to also sell wines from across the world. It came as a result of complaints from trade partners, claiming the old rule violated free trade agreements. Yeah, politics has entered into the wine business quite a bit lately between this and Alberta. There are currently 10 Loblaw grocers that offer wine. The company says the selection will soon include domestic and international brands. But Save on Foods is choosing a different approach. So we don't plan to change uh, what we're doing. The curation of our uh, BC local wines is going to stay the same. So no Chilean or French wines on these shelves anytime soon. The company says it started selling BC wines to help build the local economy. Our interest when we first got into the wine business to really uh, build on the BC wines and we've done that and that's our uh, story going forward. We're going to continue to do just that, sell BC wines. This one is really lovely for lamb, duck, rabbit, goose, venison, bison. But there are some locals who are still feeling nice left out, like the Festina Lente Meadery in Langley. It's great to allow the, the uh, imported wines in. However, there are a bunch of wines that are, are not allowed in. Products like their honey wine and other fruit wines don't meet the VQA standards because they aren't made of grapes. And the VQA holds the majority of in-store liquor licenses. Grape wine is not the only type of wine in British Columbia. There are many alternatives and many quality alternatives within, within the community. But for now, the meadery is out of luck as more international competition heads to the shelves. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Langley. Well, shoppers in Victoria can once again use plastic bags for now. The city has lost a battle in BC's Court of Appeal over its ban of single-use plastics. The ban was unanimously quashed because the court says Victoria's main goal with the bylaw was to protect the environment. That means it requires approval from the Ministry of Environment, something it has not gotten. The community has embraced this bylaw. Our business community has embraced this bylaw. And since the time the bylaw came into effect, it stopped 17 million plastic bags from going into our landfill. My hope is that the community will continue uh, the path that we've worked and walked together for the past year since the bylaw came into effect. The city's ban could be reenacted if it gets permission from the province. BC born rock star Jacob Hogard of Headley wants his sex assault case to go before a jury. The Headley singer made that request at a preliminary court hearing today. Do you have any comments on the allegations? Do you have any comments on the allegations? Hogard pleaded not guilty to two counts of sexual assault causing bodily harm and one count of sexual interference. Police say the charges relate to incidents in Toronto involving a woman and a girl under the age of 16. Today was the first of a two-day hearing to decide whether the case goes to trial. The allegations prompted Headley to go on an indefinite hiatus. New numbers show deaths from illicit drugs in the first five months of the year are down compared with the same period in 2018. The BC Coroner Service says 
462 people died between January and May of this year, down almost 30 percent from last year when 651 people died. The coroner service is warning the data could change once more post-mortem testing results come in, but it says this is a sign for cautious optimism. Well, one year later and flood victims in Grand Forks are fearing they'll get a lot less money than expected to rebuild their homes. As the CBC's Tanya Fletcher reports, that has some worried. The lack of compensation may force them to leave the city entirely. So the water came up to here at the highest point. And Shannon Watson walks here. through what used to be her home. It's been sitting empty, unlivable for more than a year now. Black spots of mold line the walls, an ugly reminder of everything she's lost. It was my life, right? <sighs> the smell was so bad, I had a headache instantly. She's one of dozens of flood victims trying to move on after last year's disaster. The Kettle River spilled into this neighborhood of Grand Forks. Now about 100 of these homes have to go as part of the city's plans to make the area a floodplain. The city received about a $50 million package, including funding from the federal and provincial governments. It's for flood mitigation and home buyouts, but it's under the condition that the homes are assessed at what they're worth after the floods, which in many cases isn't very much. In Watson's case, her property was valued at $150,000 before the flood hit. Well, they're only offering me 40. That's a $110,000 loss. I don't have another 25 years to do it all over again. You know, we have to look at our long-term financial security. The city says the priority is to save Grand Forks from future flooding. The mayor adds they're trying to find other ways to help residents, but he's making no promises. It is a disaster. And it's not our responsibility to make people whole. Experts call this situation unprecedented in B.C. and possibly Canada. I've never heard of an assessed value being taken after a hazard event. This disaster recovery expert says climate change is triggering more floods and fires. So while this may be the first such buyout, it likely won't be the last. We need to start being very clear with communities. Are we going to pay for you if you get flooded or can we do something now to help you move out of that flood zone, but do it in a way that is fair and equitable? But that may feel too late for people in a neighborhood that's about to disappear. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Grand Forks, BC. A massive rock slide in the Fraser Canyon is blocking four and a half million spawning salmon from getting through. But a Washington-based group thinks it may have the answer. It's commonly known as a salmon cannon, a pneumatic pressure tube that sends salmon safely over a blockage. The company behind the product says the tube isn't enough for this particular blockage. It presented a plan to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans today in hopes of building a barge to act as a complex fish passageway. Uh, that directs the fish based on the size of the fish into an appropriate uh, whoosh uh, transport tube. And that fish then it, um, enters the tube, which is misted and cooled, and it travels then uh, at, at the Big Bar site, if we were to install it there, be traveling about 500 feet in about 20 seconds. The DFO has said it's looking at all options, including trucking or even helicoptering the fish past the barge. If approved, Brian predicts the barge could be installed by July 24th and funneling fish by early August. Widespread rain has eased drought levels province-wide. The River Forecast Centre says some areas teetering on the level four have seen significant change. The most dramatic is on the west of Vancouver Island, where the drought concern has dropped to a level two. Concerns in the Fort Nelson area have also eased, going from a level four in June to a level two today, considered near normal. River forecast officials say they are watching the northwest and Haida Gwaii areas where things are still concerning, but weather forecasts suggest there may be some rain in the coming days. Yes, Brad is here now. The rain very much uh, our friend this summer. Mm -hmm.
very much is. And even though we may not be getting a lot more down here in the lower mainland, I did want to elaborate on how much rain could be expected into the more northern portions of our province. So we had specifically mentioned about Haida Gwaii and the northern portion, say, into the northeast, the Fort Nelson region. I just wanted to show you on the map here, in fact, what we can be seeing over the next 12 to 24 hours, really. It doesn't look like a lot, but really the fact that there's a lot of cloud cover and there's a lot of green on that map there does indicate that we are going to be getting some more rainfall into that region. And this is good news because, of course, when we're talking about uh, how dangerous the sorry fire danger rating could be, um, this is definitely an improvement from all of that. And on that note, this is what I wanted to show you. You're going to notice here that Haida Gwaii specifically is one of those areas that's still presently in the high region uh, compared to anywhere down in the south. So getting some additional rain in the forecast over the next 12 to 24 hours is really good news. Now, with that said, we do have some severe thunderstorm watches in effect right now for parts of the interior of BC. And in fact, these stretch all the way up into the Yukon. Now, nothing has come out of this since they were issued earlier on in the day. These have not been upgraded into severe thunderstorm warnings. However, this doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's just that the conditions right now are not nearly as favorable as they had been. But down here in the south, temperatures are really going to be the only story that we're going to be dealing with. There isn't a lot to go on the radar here, just a little bit of cloud cover. And other than that, it's going to be a pretty nice couple of days. Sounds good. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Well, and that rain we've been getting is certainly reducing the wildfire threat, but it is also helping in an unexpected way. Yeah, at a time of year when we use the most water, our reservoirs remain about 85% full. So that begs the question, why do we still need watering restrictions in Metro Vancouver? Water, water, everywhere. And more than 290 billion liters of it available to drink or water, or wash. 290 billion liters from three reservoirs in the Capilano, Seymour, and Coquitlam watersheds. At the beginning of June, they were all full. You know, we are very fortunate in the fact that we have our protected watersheds and, and we're able to, you know, collect that snow and, and rainwater and, uh, you know, have it uh, stored in the, you know, high up in the North Shore Mountains and then it flows by gravity. I think we have some advantages in, in terms of having to do uh, how we treat the water and deliver it. And we never get even close to having what could be called a water shortage. So here's the question. Why, every year with all this water available, do we have to go through almost six months of watering restrictions? Six months, starting May 1st. We need to make sure that the water that we have will sustain both our uses uh, domestically, uh, around our houses and other businesses, etc., and uh, also that we have enough capacity for firefighting and some other vital needs within the community. Yes, uh, we can keep using more and more water and develop more and more sources, but if we can control that demand, it uh, makes the system that much more efficient overall. Even with watering restrictions, the city of Vancouver says water use in the region doubles in the summer due to lawn and garden watering. One hour of lawn watering can use as much water as 25 toilet flushes, five loads of laundry, and five dishwasher loads combined. In the summer of 2015, Metro Vancouver had a particularly dry summer. Three reservoirs experienced very low water levels due to lack of precipitation. Reservoir levels reached a water level that was below its normal range in July. Stage three water restrictions were imposed. Watering lawns, washing cars outdoors, and refilling pools were banned. But what about Metro Vancouver's future water supply? The snowpack is predicted to shrink by 56% by 2050. And by then, the region can expect a 20% decrease in rainfall during the summer months. Another 1 million people are expected to arrive in the region by 2050, and there are predictions of a water supply gap by 2030. A project is underway right now at the Coquitlam Lake Reservoir to source more water. There we have a second intake project which will allow us to tap into a significant greater volume of water. And if you look into the longer term prognosis, uh, well into uh, mid-century and beyond, around 2070 or so, then we need to look for additional supplies of uh, source water. As for the sources we have right now, they're adequate. Don't expect the region to ever ease up on watering restrictions. Yeah, they're never going to say, just, just use as much water as you want. But uh, the reservoirs are in, in pretty good shape. I checked the... Uh, with all the uh, rain we've had? With all the rain, yeah. yeah. They're at, uh, as of a couple of days ago, at 84%, which uh, for this time of year is pretty darn Sounds good. Sounds great. And it's so green out there, right? <laughs> no need to water, yes. 
All right, well, that story and all of our others are available for you to watch and share online. Just follow us on Twitter at CBC News BC. And CBC Vancouver on Facebook and YouTube. You can also stream this newscast live and on demand on our free mobile app, CBC Gem. Well, the easiest part was getting together for a photo, but it wasn't the most amicable ending to the Premier's meeting in Saskatchewan. The sticking points coming next. Okay, a lot of goat stories these days, yes, and uh, you can now go from doing yoga with goats to having coffee with goats. Why wouldn't you? Sounds like a potential food safety <laughs> violation, though. But the shop, CBC's Sarah's Cavani boss, says it's turning out to be good for business. He was looking right into your eyes there. I think you wouldn't know it, but this is part of a coffee shop. This goat pen is behind Fancy's coffee counter in Murray River. It's fun for customers, and it's also helping a local organization. Uh, just really helping out anything in the community. Is it, it feels good for us. Like we, we never started the coffee shop hoping to get rich, but it's really awesome to be able to give back a little bit, and it, it makes us feel good about being here. A group called Inclusions East supplies 40% of the baked goods here. That group helps people with intellectual disabilities find jobs and learn new skills. The shop hired James Larder. I clean the, the hay and rake up the leaves. And how do you like working with the goats? Good. Why? I love it. <laughs> when we got the opportunity to hire someone new, and I had worked with Inclusions East in the past, just uh, teaching an international cooking class, which was something fun for me to do. Um, they impressed me so much with their skills, so I, I said, why wouldn't we hire somebody from there and get them working for us? Stephen Fancy knows what it's like to face a challenge. He's legally blind. Um, I wouldn't have got to this point where I am in my career and with my life and all the things that I've done without tons of support. So it's just, if I get a chance to do that, yeah, it's a, it feels really good to finally give back. He learned to use this machine by following its sounds. Any tips he makes from coffees or other orders, he donates back. It's like the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> People visit the goats for free and can also make a donation. The money collected will help build a new center for Inclusions East. Sarah Kivanivas, CBC News, Murray River. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone loves a good goat story. So Everybody does, yes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I saw yesterday, too, actually. There were somebody who was posting goats on Instagram, random goats everywhere, and hearts are flying in these comment sections. And <laughs> as long as there's a goat in a story, people are happy. Exactly. Well, make a note of that. We'll try to assign one for the next few days. Perfect. Maybe. All right, we'll be back with more news right after this. Canada's premiers are ending their annual conference saying their unity is strong, particularly on economic issues and trade between provinces. But as the CBC's David Cochran reports, there are some exceptions. <laughs> it's easy to get everyone together for the cameras, harder to get them together on big issues such as climate change. It's real and, uh, and the voting public will be deciding this is a hot button issue and every region and every territory, every province needs to have a comprehensive plan. Five provinces have complied with Ottawa's climate plan. Five others oppose it, with several taking it to court. While they litigate, territorial premiers deal with the impacts firsthand in the Arctic. I think uh, we see it as an important job for us is to educate people in the south that uh, 
that uh, their actions are having a, a big effect on us. It's a blunt and reminder at a conference where there has been a lot of talk about pipelines, another big fracture point that pits British Columbia and Quebec against for, uh, all of the provinces in between. It's true. It's one of the points on which we disagree, so we agree to disagree on this point. Where the premiers did agree is on a letter-writing campaign to all federal leaders in the run-up to the election, asking them dozens of detailed questions on everything from jobs to health care to Arctic sovereignty. So to each of the federal leaders, I encourage you to review this letter sent on behalf of this nation's 13 premiers, a nation that is waiting for your response. Maybe so, but at least one premier has made up his mind. Justin Trudeau has failed this country. David Cochran, CBC News, Saskatoon. The rules on medically assisted death are too restrictive, at least according to two women in Quebec. As the CBC's Sarah Levitt reports, their father killed himself after he was turned down three times for a doctor's help in dying. So this was the chair. Signs of Jacques Campo's deteriorating health are all over his home. Diagnosed with multiple sclerosis 16 years ago, the 55-year-old was suffering. For our, our dad, there was no quality of life. My mom had uh, to cut his food so small. His daughters say Campo became withdrawn and despondent. He would call us and I'm on the floor for like two hours now. Can you come back home? I was waiting for your break. He was unable to celebrate Catherine's graduation or the birth of his granddaughter. Campo felt the only answer was medically assisted death. First, you don't want to be like self-centered and say, I don't want you to die because we love you. But at a certain point, you need to understand that it's his life. He applied three times over three years. Each time he was rejected, deemed not to be near end of life. So he took his own. The third time that he got refused, we understand now that it was for him a signal that if he wanted to uh, end his life uh, with, with dignity, yeah, with dignity mm -hmm. it was his only option. Campo's daughters now hope his story can lead to change. They want people to sign a petition which is before Quebec's National Assembly. They're urging the government to expand the criteria for access to medical aid in dying, to consider those with chronic diseases who aren't necessarily at the end of their natural lives. We want to fight for him because he he hadn't the strength anymore to fight for this. Campo's case parallels that of two Montrealers with degenerative diseases. They're challenging Quebec and Canada's medical aid in dying laws in court. A decision has not yet been reached. Unfortunately, there will be other uh, Jacques Campos. There have been others before. There will be others again. People who don't see any other option to end their intolerable suffering. Campos' memory lives on in the photos that adorn his walls. Happier times before his disease made life unbearable. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Laval. A frightening incident over the Pacific. An Air Canada flight en route to Australia forced to land in Hawaii with multiple injuries. We'll have the latest next. In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Mung, what do you have to say to the charges? I'm Stephen Quinn, the host of a new CBC Vancouver original podcast. This is Sanction, the arrest of a telecom giant. It's the complicated story of how and why Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was arrested. Download Sanction today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. But as the cost of real estate goes up, so does the cost of commercial rents. And that's one of the main reasons why gas stations have found themselves having to charge slightly higher retail margins. Land costs and credit card processing fees are partially to blame for high gas prices in this province. That's according to the BC Utilities Commission, which also admits it doesn't know what the other reasons are. Overall, I think it's been great exposure, but party had to come to an end sometime. So. Grocery stores that sell wine in BC will soon be able to expand what they offer. They're already allowed to get a license to stock the shelves with wine, mead and cider from BC, but starting immediately they can bring in international products, but many stores say they won't be. Well, a moment of chaos and panic. That's all it took to cut short an Air Canada flight from Vancouver to Sydney, Australia. In the blink of an eye, severe turbulence gave the plane a violent shake, causing some serious injuries among the 284 people on board and a sudden detour to Hawaii. Jacqueline Hansen has passenger reaction tonight and a word about safety. These travelers didn't see it coming. It was so quick and so sudden and so unexpected. We hit turbulence and we all hit the roof. And the oxygen masks came down and uh, you had a lot of panic. And then it was over. In an instant, the quiet flight from Vancouver to Sydney became a scene of fear and confusion. Passengers say medical professionals who happened to be on the flight helped assess injuries. Then the plane was turned around and diverted to Honolulu. Air Canada says 35 customers sustained minor injuries from what it calls unforecasted and sudden turbulence. Hawaiian officials later clarified that 37 passengers and crew were injured, nine seriously. Uh, we had several patients with neck and back injuries, some with uh, lacerations to the head, some head injuries. In cases of clear air turbulence, crews often don't have time to tell passengers to buckle up. The seatbelt signs weren't on, we had no indication that anything was going to happen. In 2015, an Air Canada flight crew did see the turbulence coming and warned passengers. Even then, 21 people were injured. Canada's Transportation Safety Board later found that many passengers ignored instructions to fasten up. It shared this simulation to show what happens if turbulence hits when seatbelts aren't on. This flight attendant instructor says passengers shouldn't wait for a light or an order to buckle up. It's very important that passengers take responsibility for their safety. When you are sitting in your seat and you will have your seatbelt on, there's less of a chance to be injured because you won't be, become a projectile. After today's travel chaos, passengers are relieved to be on solid ground. Air Canada was amazing and the ground crew here was amazing. and. Yeah, we don't, we, don't know what ha we don't know what happened. It was a freak accident. But some researchers say extreme turbulence is on the rise and passengers should try to be as prepared as possible for the unpredictable. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. It's coming up on 635 on this Thursday evening. A live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. A few clouds around over the North Shore Mountains, but no rain in sight. Brett's full forecast coming next.
A tropical storm winding its way toward New Orleans now has a name as it gets set to become a hurricane. Barry could make landfall tomorrow or Saturday. And as Kim Brunhuber explains, residents have good reason to worry. On a flooded New Orleans street, a rare lighthearted moment. But with a tropical storm barreling down, there may soon be little to laugh about. The Mississippi River is already twice as high as it normally is at this time of the year. The coming surge could raise it to levels not seen in New Orleans in 70 years. Already, residents trudge through knee-deep water after days of rain inundated the city. We're just completely stranded here. In Plaquemines Parish, outside New Orleans, thousands have been ordered to evacuate. Oh, hammers. Tornado. The severe weather has already damaged homes. It's soaking wet. I'm missing the beginning of my day trying to get across the street to the Marriott. I can't even get across the street to the Marriott. But wind isn't the real danger. Water is uh, the killer 75% um, of the time when it comes to hurricanes and tropical storms. It's not the wind. Meteorologists are predicting that the Mississippi River could rise up to the height of the New Orleans levees, perhaps the biggest test of the city's flood defenses since Katrina. We cannot pump our way out of the water levels and the waterfalls that are expected to hit the city of New Orleans. And authorities say don't count on anyone coming to the rescue. If the worst case scenario does happen, we'll never have enough assets. Experts advise don't get hung up on whether Barry ends up being a tropical storm or a hurricane. Don't worry about the category. The bottom line, it's going to get wet and it's going to be bad. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Wet indeed. Yeah, mm. I really like his point there. It doesn't so much matter if it's a tropical storm or if it's a category. There's a lot of rain coming. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of strong winds with this, and this is just a disaster waiting to unfold. And um, to an area that is is still actually recovering. Well, exactly. From the last and I'm not sure if you know this, but half the state of Louisiana is actually below sea level. Mm. So when you consider how much rain is coming, it's very likely that flooding is going to be very widespread here. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show you what it looks like right now in terms of what Barry is doing over the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this may not look like something you're familiar with. It doesn't have that characteristic eye, and that's because Barry is just getting organized as we speak. The water levels um, across the region are already quite high, as we mentioned, but the water temperature, rather, of the Gulf of Mexico is quite warm. And this is going to be really fueling this storm and allow it to come together and wrap around very tightly over the next 12 to 24 hours. I did want to show you what it is going to be doing over the next little while. Presently, Barry is at 75 kilometers an hour sustained wind, so this would put it at a tropical storm. As soon as it reaches 119 kilometers an hour, then it is going to be given hurricane status at a category one. Watch this unfold. Over the next 24 hours or so, it is going to be making its way west and then northwest. And throughout the pre dawn hours of Saturday, this is when it's most likely to be making landfall along the south central coast of Louisiana. After it does so, it's going to rapidly weaken as it goes over land, but it is still going to be bringing quite a lot of rain to the whole region and potentially even impacting weather patterns across southern Ontario in. Into next week. Now with that said, the rainfall that we're talking about here is actually breaking our legend. This is actually looking at half a meter of rain, which would be 500 millimeters, or essentially five times the amount that this legend would normally be showing. So unfortunately, it is not looking good for them. However, closer to home, we don't have anywhere near this amount of rainfall. We're actually entering into a bit of a drier spell, especially down across the lower mainland. When we're looking at Friday as a whole province-wide, you're going to notice that our rain is largely going to be up toward Haida Gwaii into the northwest region where we do need it and aside from that it's just going to be a little bit of cloud here and there. Temperatures are going to be very close to seasonal, a little bit warmer into the interior and on the note of temperatures I did want to mention that it's going to be kind of boring I might even say for the next few days if you like 22s and 21s well you've got plenty of that for the next little while. Lots of sunshine is going to be coming into the forecast for the weekend I know it was a bit more of a cloudy day today uh, a little bit more cloud than sun but we're going to notice this trend continuing honestly for the next foreseeable future so all in all, definitely better than a hurricane, I would say. I wouldn't call that boring, No, though. No, you're okay with it? Yeah. 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 Kind of boring. It's a on, good Brett. kind of boring. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> like I said a few days ago, I feel like you're just the rain guy. You just want... I enjoy my rain. Uh -huh. It's all right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Tension in the Gulf Coast escalated today, this time between Iran and the United Kingdom. Why a British oil tanker was seized coming up.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year. So grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. And join us at the Surrey Fusion Festival on July 20th to 21st at Holland Park. Swing by our tent for fun and prizes and meet CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Michelle Elliott. For more on these events, check us out online. The tension appears to be escalating tonight between the UK and Iran. There has been another confrontation near the Persian Gulf, and as the CBC's Chris O'Neill Yates reports, this time it involves a British oil tanker. The British are saying that Iran has flouted international law after three Iranian vessels attempted to block the passage of the BP oil tanker British Heritage through the Strait of Hormuz. A statement released by the Ministry of Defense this morning says HMS Montrose was forced to position herself between the Iranian vessels and British Heritage and issue verbal warnings to the Iranian vessels, which then turned away. We are concerned by this action and continue to urge the Iranian authorities to de-escalate the situation in the region. The Iranian boats, the British say, belong to the Revolutionary Guard. In what officials are describing as a fairly dramatic scene, guns on the HMS Montrose were trained on the vessels and they ordered them through radio contact to move away. The Iranians are, of course, denying all this, any claims they tried to seize a British tanker. They say they've had no confrontations with any tankers, any vessels at all, in the last 24 hours. Foreign Minister Mohammad Javed Zarif claims that this is just the UK trying to create tensions. Now, tensions have been ratcheted up in the Gulf since President Donald Trump tightened the noose on Iran when he pulled out of the 2015 nuclear agreement. In recent months, several tankers have been attacked. Just last week, British soldiers boarded an Iranian vessel off the coast of Gibraltar. It said it had evidence it was carrying Iranian crew to Syria that would have been in breach of EU sanctions. Britain blamed the Iranian regime for attacks on two tankers back in June. Foreign Minister Jeremy Hunt of the UK says they are monitoring all of this very closely. Obviously very concerning developments, but also I'm very proud of the Royal Navy and the role that they played in keeping British assets, British shipping safe. Uh, we are continuing to monitor the situation very, very carefully. We are constantly monitoring the security and constantly keeping under review the kind of security that we need uh, to keep uh, British shipping safe. Iran is in a tough spot economically right now. These sanctions imposed by the U.S. and the EU mean they can't sell their oil on the international market. Trump has warned that more sanctions, substantially increased sanctions, are coming, so tensions may just escalate in the Gulf as Iran gets even more desperate. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, London. Two leading Canadian pension plans are coming under scrutiny for some controversial investments. The Ontario Teachers Plan and the Alberta Provincial Plan bought shares in a U.S. company that runs migrant detention centers. As Lauren Pelley reports, one human rights organization is raising a red flag. Migrant detention centers south of the border have stirred controversy amid allegations of subpar medical care, poor living conditions and segregation. Activists have brought their fight to the streets and right to the doorsteps of multiple facilities. Many of the sites are owned by GEO Group, and a report from the internal watchdog for U.S. Homeland Security said conditions at one of the company's California facilities may violate detainees' rights. And that's why there was such a concern and such a, an uproar from members across Ontario, because this doesn't match our values. Outcry was swift from Teachers Online after CBC Toronto first reported this morning the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan invested more than half a million dollars in the private prison operator in the first quarter of this year. The Alberta Pension Plan, a Crown Corporation, invested close to $5 million in both Geo Group and another prison operator. The uh, idea of having uh, 
pension funds and, and others invested in companies that may be associated with human rights abuses is very is very troubling. I think this is a time when, when people should be being careful about uh, what it is that their investments are funding. CBC News reached out to both pension plans for their response. Representatives from Alberta didn't comment, but a spokesperson for the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan said it did have shares in Geo Group, but divested them in early April. In a statement, the spokesperson said, we regret holding exposure to this stock. Our members care deeply about human rights and we are committed to investing responsibly. Some Ontario teachers who were gathered for a conference today in Ottawa want to make sure it's a promise that's upheld. This shouldn't have slipped through the cracks, that's the bottom line. Even though it is a very small amount, we're talking about $500,000 in a $191 billion plan. That's very small, but it's significant because it sends a message. And teachers want to make sure that our, you know, that the investments that the plan makes matches the values that we promote in the classroom every day. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. The Navy has just released a long-awaited study on the health impacts of a fatal fire on board a submarine back in 2004. More than half the crew that survived suffered serious illnesses in the years that followed. We think the greatest risk was right at the time of the fire when the smoke was produced. That's where the substances are that, uh, that can cause the health problems. Water entered HMCS Shakutami through open hatches causing an electrical fire and black smoke filled the sub. One sailor died, several crew members were injured. The review of the medical files of the 56 surviving crew members shows a majority suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, with climate change, longer stretches of extreme heat are expected to be the new reality. Researchers at the Montreal Heart Institute want to learn how to help people cope. And as Alison Northcott explains, they're using a special kind of lab to do it. So right to the end on the seat. Yeah, boy. 74-year-old <laughs> Michel Dupuis is in the hot seat, a room designed to simulate a dangerous heat wave. Before we get a blood pressure, we wipe the arm to make sure that all the sweat's gone. Researchers are studying some of the people most vulnerable in the heat, older adults with underlying health conditions. So we're really trying to find th simple solutions that anybody could use at home just to stay cool if they don't ha have access to air conditioning to minimize the impact of heat waves on individuals' health. Today, your trial is going to be 38 degrees Celsius, 60% relative humidity. Before heading in, Dupuis was fitted with electrodes and capsules. With his heart and lung conditions, real heat waves are tough to handle. I feel that it, it's hard. I don't have a, a much, as much as energy as I would have. We'll continue to ask you how hot do you feel, how comfortable do you feel, we'll take your blood pressure. We always hear kind of typical guidelines during heat waves. Um, obviously they make sense and they're intuitive, but it, surprisingly not a whole lot of them are backed up by scientific data. So we're really trying to bring the science behind what's being recommended. For instance, by testing the use of fans, wet sponges, or a combination of both. Relax and enjoy. Relax and enjoy. Your margaritas are on the way. Dupuis' skin temperature, sweat rate, and heart rate are closely monitored and recorded. Anecdotally, people always tell us that the skin wetting feels amazing, and they always feel more comfortable and a lot more cool when they are using the skin wetting and then the skin wetting with the fan. Um, but from a cardiovascular and a thermal point of view, it's really hard to conclude any findings yet. During Montreal's heat wave last summer, public health officials say 66 people died from the heat. Many of them were over the age of 65. The hope is that public health agencies could use the eventual findings of this study to minimize the risk during future heat waves. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Well, a ball game in Windsor was abruptly cancelled because of some unwelcome flying spectators. We'll take you out to the ball game after the break.
Well, Little League Baseball is, for the most part, about uh, replicating the feel of the big leagues, and during the evening, that's all about the big lights. But as the CBC's Sanjay Maru explains, at a game in Windsor, Ontario, those very lights brought out more than a few unwelcome spectators. The Force Glade Baseball League is hitting the tail end of its season, and that means kids are looking to fit in as much playtime as possible. On a typical night, this is the scene during game time, but earlier this week, it was a different story, as the bright lights attracted this giant swarm of fish flies, forcing the game to be stopped just after the third inning. The umpire stood up, had uh, maybe 60 to 100 of them on, on his back, just completely covered. Kids were in the outfield, they couldn't see. It was, it was mainly called for the safety of the players. Oh my God, my God. <laughs> it was disgusting. <laughs> They were hitting me in the face, like flying in my ears, like on my clothes everywhere. It was really distracting. What are we seeing right now? This is your impression of the umpire? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, he couldn't even he see. He was covered. <laughs> but it's not just players feeling the wrath of the fish flies. Some parents say they've been forced to watch games from inside their cars since the bugs have been out in full force. I know one of the, the moms had a sweatshirt she had tied like up tight to cover her face and then she was hopping from her chair. Teams competed last night without having to call off the game early, but that doesn't mean the fish flies weren't out. For these players, it's just about making it to the end of the season without losing any more playtime. A season which has redefined the term fly ball. Sanjay Maru, CBC News, Windsor. Fish flies? Hearing a lot about fish flies this year in Ontario, seeing a lot of people yeah. post pictures, very disturbing. Different kind of fly fishing, I guess. Uh, that fly problem might be a good one to have compared to our next story. It started with what seemed like a prank call to 911 in Chicago. People weren't sure what they were seeing, but they were sure it shouldn't be in their river. It's a little um, strange to walk over these bridges that are, you know, a foot or two above the water knowing, yeah, there could be a five-foot alligator in there. Police quickly confirmed it was indeed a lone what? alligator, wow, over a meter long and tricky enough to avoid capture for several days. Yeah, it has now become, as you can imagine, a local attraction. The city has roped off the river for safety while it tries to catch it. It's not the first alligator to wind up in Chicago's chilly waters. Yeah, people with exotic pets who outgrow their welcome at home are suspected of sometimes dumping them into the river. No thank you to fish flies, no thank you to alligators. No. Well, not accept either. No. Exactly. We can just stay safely at our desk here and, <laughs> and avoid it all. Mm -hmm. And those eyes are just beating out. No, you don't want to see that in your local river. No. Sure. Hey, you can always uh, find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is here with Tina Lovegreen after the National. Have a good night. Good night.